Okay. Well, thanks very much, um, everybody, and Carl in particular, for having us. Um, and I'd like to also pay my respects to the Ghana Plains people, past and present. Um, this is going to be a presentation that's been an integrated presentation with three speakers. So we're trying to bring together our different perspectives and knowledge bases in this one presentation. So we'll be jumping in and off the microphone uh, as we go. But um, I just want to uh, revisit um, some of the rationales for family services integration. One of the questions that the speakers have put to us is what do we think we're trying to do? So we're going to just briefly review some of the literature that might be well known to some of you about the reasons that family services integration is seen as a good thing and some of the key elements of the literature, uh, sorry, the, so, some of the key elements identified in the literature around how do you know when you've got an integrated service going? What, what are the things you might look for? We then want to briefly visit the policy context, what is the terrain we're working in and what are some of the constraints and structures, before moving along to look specifically at Communities for Children Salisbury, part of that is the Family Zone Hub at Ingle Farm. And we've been doing, uh, Ali and I, in conjunction with uh, the Family Zone Hub, have been doing an evaluation of the service there and we've brought along some of the findings uh, as part of that. And then if we have a little bit of time at the end, we'd like to talk, uh, Carl's going to be talking to some of the other sites of communities for children so we can see how various services operate. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Ali for the first section. Thank you. Hello. Um, I acknowledge the privilege that I have received as uh, um, the descendant of uh, people from uh, England and um, Britain as large. I've received a lot of privileges uh, through the invasion of this country. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the rationales behind um, integration. Uh, and there's several reasons why we're seeing an increased emphasis on integrated services for children and their families. Uh, with rising rates of um, uh, preventable disease, the pressure's on for health budgets to include more prevention pro uh, programs. And as Paula Barrett said yesterday, po most politicians have their eye on the next election and are not terribly interested in preventing future ills. So naturally governments want to do prevention in the most cost-effective way, and this might include programs sharing premises and resources. Um, the, another reason is because research has clearly shown relationships between health outcomes and social circumstances such as poverty and poor education levels, it's now clear that disease prevention and treatment must go hand in hand with support for better education and income generation in families, as well as more effective parenting. Uh, Australian Aboriginal, ancient Chinese, African and Western traditional societies have always known that supporting children's development was crucial to their future outcomes as, as a society. Yet somehow this point has escaped many policy makers of the industrialised world so that the needs of young children have been considered too trivial to receive consideration within policy debates. However, in recent decades, new research has revealed a lot about the importance of brain development in the first years for, the, for nations' future health, literacy and social functioning. And this hard science from men in white coats has meant that us nice early childhood ladies have proof to support our advocacy for young children and some politicians have been listening. Um, the work of Bronfenbrenner, Hart and Risley and many others have demonstrated that children's outcomes are powerfully influenced by their family contexts. This and the recognition of the damage done to the stolen generations by policies that ignore the importance of family in children's lives has vigorously disrupted any idea that children can be effectively educated or properly raised without supporting effective parenting. 
Inquiries such as the South Australian Virtual Village Inquiry into Early Childhood Services found that services such as preschool education were largely not accessible to the children of working mothers. Those of you who work in disadvantaged areas know that there are many barriers to access, including lack of transport and information about services. And this has led to the need, uh, a recognition of the need for one-stop shops and catering across um, the time span of early childhood. Um, I'm now going to go into some of the key elements of uh, successful integrated services. And uh, Paul, please excuse my use of the word centre. Um, you know, when you're putting together PowerPoint, you have to crunch down ideas into um, just a few words, otherwise you get a crowded slide. So really what I'm talking about is in, uh, when I talk about centres, I mean the people, of course, that work in them. So um, in, uh, in successful uh, um, uh, so integrated settings or services, there's a, a problem of managing uh, what uh, Nichols and Javansu refer to as multi-layered policy landscape. Uh, to meet the needs of children in their community. And this is uh, really a problem because uh, the, there's so many p inputs into this policy landscape. There's the non-government organisations policies, there's state government policies, there's Commonwealth government co policies, and the integrated setting has to manage all these. Um, and also, I just uh, want to uh, reiterate what uh, um, was mentioned before about the language that we use. For example, in this, uh, uh, the sentence at the, f at the top talks about meeting the needs of the children and family in its community. Now, what even does the word community mean? Does it mean the children and families who attend that setting? Uh, uh, in which case, where is the voice and access for the children and families that are not attending that setting? Or does community meet the wider community? And who's included in the wider community? And how can their voice be heard? Um, so managing these multiple uh, programs and there's complex sets of regulations and there's all these different funding sources and lines of accountability, to, to do this um, successfully, um, there, there needs to be a lot of shared understanding uh, and also a very creative, uh, well-informed, organised leadership with strong, well-communicated vision. And the speakers this morning uh, were very eloquent in talking about this. Um, and when I refer to leadership, I don't mean a single individual. I'm referring to often shared leadership or collaborative leadership, or what Rod calls collaborative leadership. And to do this effectively, where you have all these different requirements, that usually require, to, to manage it, that means uh, having strong relationships and also some degree of continuity uh, there. Um, the other thing I want to refer to is um, what uh, Fraser used to talk about when he, I used to follow him around. He used to talk about, uh, whenever we went to an integrated setting, he talked about the people that were running it as orchestra leaders. And basically what he was saying is that these people are having to manage all these, all these players so that they all sang to the same tune, which was the child. Uh, and part of that, of course, is the child in the family. Um, and what, the other thing that, ha that happened to me as I was listening to the managers of these uh, or leaders of these settings, I kept hearing tales of non-compliance and how to get things done, they had to bend and break the rules and take risks. So effective centres need to some extent be non-compliant and this was referred to in the two um, excellent um, presentations this morning. 
Um, when a, a integrated setting is working effectively, the service providers that do all the different roles are very informed about each other's roles and constraints, and they engage in lots of shared planning, shared budgets, and program delivery, so that who buys the milk is uh, um, a shared thing. Uh, so this requires a shared vision, and often that takes a lot of talking to nut out what that is. Lots of open communication, trust, goodwill, and professional respect. Well-integrated settings manage to make themselves more accessible and responsive to the needs of all parents and children in the wider community than before integration. And this means putting the children and, the, and their families at the centre of all decisions about program provision and, the, and indeed what model of integration the services are using. And it also requires high quality. And when I'm talking about quality, I must include the very important aspect of quality is that the services are culturally safe. Parents who do not believe uh, that, they're, that the staff in this service respect their culture will choose not to use the service. When an uh, integrated settings are uh, working well, the problems are identified and addressed earlier than before integration. And of course, for this to occur, we need high quality and good communication and coordination. And we also see in well-functioning uh, integrated settings a lot of family participation. Participation is that next step from access where parents are really deeply involved in what goes on. And uh, this is when they work together in partnership uh, to improve the children's well-being, learning and development. And I think to achieve this, and Paul I know agrees because he said this quite emphatically in his presentation, that um, the families need to take a big part in the governance of the um, uh, integrated settings. Finally, we know when we've got an integrated set of services uh, is working well, is when we see improved child development in the wider community than before integration. This, after all, is the ultimate aim. And uh, to achieve this, we need quality programs for children linked with programs to support happier, more effective parenting. And now I'll hand over. Thank you. Okay. Oh, what do I do? Just... Which... That one? Yep. Okay. So we talked about multi-layer policy environment and of course um, Australia, like the United States uh, and Canada, uh, has the complexity of state governments as well as federal governments and divisions of service delivery between those two. Um, the current context in Australia, we've got at the federal level, uh, FAXIA Family Support Program, which includes Communities for Children which is one of the examples of integrated children's services provision. We have the Early Years Learning Framework agenda out of COAG. Uh, we have the National Framework for Protecting Australia's Children, uh, again, being implemented through COAG. That's the Council of Australian Governments, the supposedly joined up uh, body which develops and implements federal state partnership projects uh, at, a, at a federal level. And in South Australia in particular, as we know, we have a program to roll out integrated children's centres. And the services that are included in that bundle, we've got childcare preschool, child health, uh, maternal and child health, specialist para-health services, um, and adult education are some of the bundle that often end up in, uh, have formed some of the profiles of children's centres. But I think that that's one of the points, is that there is no prescriptive content of what we mean by services integration and I think that's a good thing because it allows greater responsiveness to the needs of the community. And I would make the note that services that haven't had an adult education focus miss an opportunity in my experience and observation to have reasons for adults to come and to hang about and spend time. And of course if you don't come and if you don't stay and if you don't spend time with other people you never get to feel that you belong there. So um, 
Having, and, and, and a lot of parents that come for adult education are coming because they've felt that they've been locked out of earlier pathways, perhaps through school or at their school leaving point, but where they're coming to a service with their young children, quite often they're ready to think about, well, what am I doing? I'm focusing on uh, what's good for my child, but I also, and, and the services intersection also encourages them to think about what's good for them. Um, I'll now get Carl to talk about um, Communities for Children as one of the managers, and we'll revisit that one as well. Thank you, Elspeth. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about this. You can probably find most of it on the Faxia website. Um, but Communities for Children, obviously, it's around to uh, deliver sustainable outcomes for um, at-risk children and families in disadvantaged sites throughout Australia. There are 45 of those sites, and there are now another 10 in the Communities for Children Plus um, developments. There are four priority areas, and the priority areas are healthy young families, learning and care, just the physical, emotional, um, cognitive development of children, supporting families and parents, um, which has to do with building strong parent-child relationships, parenting, um, family resources, knowledge and skills, family relationships improving. Um, and then also we have um, another focus on child-friendly communities, and child-friendly communities very much the community development approach, and developing the whole community, taking a whole of community approach, and uh, seeing what so kind of changes and outcomes you can have when you actually do that. Um, and um, another one down the bottom here, or, or is, is families and children services working effectively as a system? Or, and the other one just before that, community members, its facilities and institutions work together to improve early childhood and children's health development and well-being. And that's really part of what this conference is about. Part of Communities for Children has been to be given the brief of, of trying to do that. Um, and Faxia took a big risk four or five years ago, uh, probably six actually, um, in giving um, little non-government organisations around the country and big non-government organisations around the country the opportunity to do that. Um, and um, we've had the opportunity to do that and it's been, it's been a really exciting journey. Um, the, the structure was very much a bottom-up structure and uh, if you look there you'll notice um, I didn't really have the time to obliterate Stronger Families and Communities Partnership from the slide. <laughs> um, so I put Family Support Program in right over the top, but then I thought, well, actually, <laughs> that's been one of the great achievements that has happened in terms of the government's ability to maintain a program from a previous government, uh, slightly change it, develop it, modify it, but keep communities for children, and I think that's been a just a fantastic initiative to see that, and that's a change, and that's a significant change. So we've got both of them on the slide. And facts here, of course, have changed their name. <laughs> um, they were facts when we started. But it's, it's very much the bottom-down approach, um, I'll do it on this side, where you've got this, this family support program undergirding a facilitating partner from a local area who's a key agency in the local area who knows the local scene, is able to work with the local scene. Um, and then you've got a local evaluator working with them, and that's what we've got here with um, Elspeth and um, Ali. And uh, then there's a Communities for Children Committee, which, um, uh, which is really key stakeholders and representatives from the community, um, and also engages very much parents and, and uh, others who are um, leaders in the community to, to meet together regularly. When we first started, for the first six months, we met fortnight, fortnightly. We met a lot and we talked a lot and we developed a community strategic plan. And uh, then it was all about implementing that through subcontracting local non-government organisations and some uh, council agencies, etc., uh, and local service providers to roll out something for children, families and the community. And um, very much the bottom-up approach and very much a community development approach. Elspeth. Um, yes, yeah, so I just put up this slide I was thinking about, so when we look at who's present in integrated children's services, I thought it worthwhile to list some of the kinds of services and map some of the professional occupations against those services, uh, the people that they're delivering, just so you can see the absolute breadth of professional uh, education and understandings. And when you think about that list and you think about 
how those services work with families and what each of those services might want to do with families, that the challenge of bringing together shared understandings and shared vision, which many of our speak, all of our speakers have has emphasised as absolutely of fundamental importance, it is going to be a mammoth task, not least of which because of the professional education directs a, a, a um, preservation and a protection of what has come to be defined as this set of professional skills. So in a sense, <clears throat> what Margaret was talking about in terms of graduate programs of education for integrated children's services workers is trying to find some kind of education architecture to fit on top of this huge breadth of professional education. Um, and I think also it emphasises that it, we're not going to get one kind of worker who will have expertise in all of these professions. It's not, uh, I, I think that that person would have to be kind of Aristotle and Socrates and the brainies and Einstein maybe rolled into one and they'd be overworked. Um, so we're not going to do away with those professional divisions in real terms, I don't think, but what we do have to build is the architecture that enables us to talk um, across those different services. And I just want to tell um, a brief anecdote too to illustrate um, the silo issue that we were talking about in one service I was at, not Carl's service. It was a deck site, uh, integrated children's site, and in the installation of the new buildings with the centre, a pipe, a plumbing pipe, had been broken on campus. And it was affecting the whole of the campus because plumbing pipes are interconnected. So it's a deck site, an incomes a contractor for, uh, to build the preschool building. The pipe is broken, all services are affected. Whose budget should it come from? Who should pay for the plumber? It was a huge issue and it was one that they didn't have any guidance around what, how should the pipe blockage be fairly shared. But it is a really good illustration, I thought, of the, both the interconnectedness of services, but also the real challenges when you come back to your accountants and your budgets and your expenditures and sort of figure out how you allocate those four days on site with plumbers with backhoes and tree root digger upperers and like it was a big job. Um, so we've not only got the challenge at that professional level and how we build professional intersections and get ourselves talking a similar language and understanding what we're doing when we use words, even like, for example, information sharing. And I thought it was really interesting, the different lenses that the different professional backgrounds and, and areas of practice brought to that phrase information sharing, which was very much conditioned by professional practice and history. Is it about teams within a particular location? Is it about uh, sharing with other agencies? Or is it about taking seriously what families have to say about what their perspectives might be? Um, so we've got, a, we've got a fair bit of complexity that we're working with, and I don't think that we're going to get there overnight, but with um, people like Margaret on the job, I think we're going to go well. So um, we're now back to the specificities of Family Zone Hub at Ingle Farm, which is the, the uh, service that Ali and I have been looking at specifically. Yes, um, it's located, Family Zone Hub is located at Ingle Farm Primary School um, and it targets families with children under five and uh, sees approximately 375 families a month. So there's a regular flow of a significant number of families and we believe it is a, a way of reaching quite a significant number, number of families and giving them the support that they need. Uh, a meeting place for staff by professionals from a number of agencies and supported by volunteers. So it's a real key kind of intersection of agencies, professionals working with volunteers and also lots of peer support that also happens. Um, it's facilitated by Lutheran Community Care. Uh, who facilitate support groups for African and Afghani communities and other new arrivals as well as TAFE English language classes. And speaking of construction, uh, when the manager took on the job from Lutheran Community Care, uh, her job description didn't include construction manager, uh, neither did it, did it include construction worker, <laughs> but that's actually what happened when she started and, and it takes people like that. Um, to be able to make decisions rather than refer to a thousand committees, just get on with it and do it. Um, mother and baby groups uh, are also facilitated with a focus on supporting maternal health, parenting groups and supported play groups. 
There's a home visiting service, which is a key outreach way of engaging with the community, with the really vulnerable families who are not ready to come into groups. After three or four visits, they often are ready to come into groups. Previously, that wasn't happening. They would just get you know, 24 visits in isolation. Um, there's a craze there for families involved with the various craft, cooking, parent education activities, and there's internet access for a range and a range of other family resources available. You like flowcharts? <laughs> we all like a flowchart. <laughs> one, one guy many years ago said to me, just look at a tree. Because <laughs> I like, he, he was perceiving that I like things to be nice and neat and structured. He said, have a look at a tree. It's not like that. Um, so it is, it is fairly complex, um, but, and it takes you a while to get your head around it in some ways, but you'd never get your head totally around it because um, that we're dealing with, um, with a lot of different things. Um, and so you can see just in, in, in um, the sort of orangey yellowy colour, uh, we have mobile supported playgroups, parenting support, um, facilitated largely by centre care, um, new parents support and education facilitated playgroup, uh, Salvation Army, which is located nearby. Um, and then we have the uh, schools ministry group doing work in schools. Uh, we have um, support to marginalised primary school children and their families happening through that, um, and early childhood leadership and other courses, including English classes, are provided by TAFE SA. DEX provides the, the property, um, and we're really building a good relationship with the school. And it's a new arrivals school, so that's why we've got lots of engagement with new, new arrivals people, and lots of volunteers, um, etc. And um, the level of relationship is kind of collaboration is with, an, uh, with a straight line and coordination with a dotted line. Um, so you've got kind of levels of relationship, collaboration and coordination happening. When we first started, we had a real mishmash of, you know, we, as, a, as a committee, we came up with the idea of what we wanted for a strategic plan. We took on staff from a number of different agencies who had no idea what the original vision was of the committee and all our different line managers, so they acted really much like children with different parents and played off one parent against the other. <laughs> Um, but we had to work through all those issues and we had some really interesting, intense meetings working out actually how to do that and how to get communication going. And it's been fantastic to see that the way the team at the Family Zone have responded over the last few years um, to, to, to establish that and get that functioning so that they really do work as a cohesive team and, and you sense that when you, when you walk into the place. Um, and um, yeah, that's the... That slide um, just shows the, the concept of an early childhood development and parenting team that uh, Fraser Mustard was talking about a little earlier on, a couple of years ago when he was out here. And uh, those, it's really the team, it's really the staff who are working in all of those different areas together and have worked out ways of working together, which, which is really, really critical. Um, they have come to understand the value of team. Together, everyone accomplishes more. Team values, shared power. Dishwashing and cleaning up, not in the, the average manager's job description, but very much a key part of it. And I really appreciate what Paul said about that. Um, understood, you know, and then this need for strong leadership. I'd probably throw in a, an, an antiquated term, servant leadership. Not very popular these days, but it's a real key to what's happening there, and that's what we see happening through the, through the family zone. Um, streamlined communication, good information sharing, Critical the discussion we had this morning, and that's been that discussion really came out of some of the things that Families Zone have grappled with. As I've sat down with Karen and talked about uh, the issues that, that they were grappling with in terms of imp implementing um, an integrated service um, within our community. And I'd throw in another word: vocation and values. Dorothy Scott started talking about vocation a couple of years ago, and you know I'll just kind of finish with it with a with a story of one um, worker there whose funding actually ran out um, at the end of 2009, or at least funding for half of her position ran out. And um, you know what happened? She, she just kept working. <laughs> and the reason she kept working was because of the relationships with the families that she had, and she just wasn't going to cut off. And thankfully, after about three or four weeks, we did get some funding come through. And, and her position is able to continue. But just to see that, you know, the this, 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 this sense um, of commitment and passion about the work that she has, and, and to see that in the staff there is, is absolutely fantastic. And that's, that's a real key to making it work. 
So, um, we're the local evaluators and um, we've been working with Carl and the team at the Family Zone um, and our evaluation methods began with what is, it, is the experience for users of the centre? How is the experience of coming to the centre working for children and families and how do they identify how it's been working for them? And to get access to that information we've done a survey of parents um, and focus groups with African and Afghani parents. We also did a brief survey of agencies that refer to and from Family Zone, as well as having a look at specific program records and some of the cases of how people move through programs. But in what we're doing just in this presentation, we're just focusing on the data from the parents survey and the focus groups. Ali? Ali did the Afghan and African focus groups. Um, there were two uh, sets of focus groups, well two focus groups, one was uh, the Afghan group and that included about three quarters of the usual attendees and the African group uh, was about a third of the usual attendees of the African group. And because I don't speak any of the African languages or Afghani, uh, we had some translators come in to um, ensure that I understood what was being said and they understood what I was asking and about consent and, all, and their rights uh, as participants and so on. And that image is of some of the um, uh, African mums, I think, taking part in the cooking group. That's one of the cooking groups that's run at Family Zone. Um, in the parents survey, we had 30, 42 respondents, 39 mums and three family daycare providers. All of our respondents, um, and I must say the data was collected on specific days um, that the data collecting researcher was able to be at the centre, so I'm not saying that it would have captured everyone, so this is a, a sample of the people who come. And it would be very much related to the days that the data collector was there. Um, so we are age 25 to 45, and one of, of course, the very interesting things about that is there's no under 25 mums interesting because that's a group of course that is identified as vulnerable. Um, most relied on wage incomes, a very small minority on Centrelink payments. Uh, three quarters were born in Australia, now this is very consistent with the um, census data, around 75% uh, around of Australians uh, born in Australia. We had two families from the UK, two from Korea, two from the Philippines. One family each from New Zealand, Germany, India, China and Japan. So you can see that there's quite a bit of cultural diversity in people coming along to Family Zone and I think that again is a good indicator um, about cultural safety that's been established at that, cent at that site. Um, as Ali was pointing out, if people feel alienated and rejected and not wanted here, they don't come. Um, most, uh, sorry, a third of respondents lived in couple households with one child, around another third lived in couple houses with two children. We had around 10% of four couple, uh, of couple households with three children and two households with four or more children. So again, fairly mapping the um, shape of Australian families. We had around uh, five single parent families. Three of these had one child, one had two children and another had three children. The reasons that they gave for attending Family Zone were really interesting and focus on um, the importance of social networks to parents of young children. Uh, 14 were a, a referral from another service and you'll recall that in the model that Carl put up um, there were uh, home visiting and uh, referrals from health services for vulnerable mums. So there's a focus on men supporting the mental health of mums and bubs and, uh, and po the postnatal depression risk particularly. So referral from another service is often picking up those referrals. Um, but at the other side, there's well mums just wanting a playgroup for their children, wanting some social contact for themselves, but also really critically, um, word of mouth, spreading the news. Hey, come along to where I'm going. Um, these were the really important reasons that mothers wanted to come along and be at the site. There was also a significant group um, who were focused on what their children needed, their children's play and social development. But really interestingly, very few were motivated specifically by the location. Um, 
possibly because they they were already geographically located there and hadn't thought about it except as their local. But it ha does have quite a wide uh, catchment area um, and it seems that people where there is a service that they value will also travel to be there. Um, this slide shows um, some of the movement of people between the various groups and it also gives you uh, an excellent overview of the, the sheer range of activities that go on at Family Zone and I think this is another important dimension of a service where the range of offerings is designed to meet needs and interests of that local community. Um, but again, I would say we weren't there on the days that the African and, uh, Afghan support groups were there. So that the absence of participants in particular uh, activities does not mean that nobody did those activities. It just means that on the days that we collected data, those participants weren't there. But some of the, what I found particularly interesting was you'll see that the um, being with baby, whoop, I'll just go back, being with baby um, and play groups and um, sessions to do with having young children often moved on as the child got older into more um, activities that were on from being a mum of a new young bub. So it enabled having a, a, a wide range of activities but also a range of activities that people could move on from once they'd exited that early infancy stage was a key part of keeping people's interest and keeping them coming. And you'll notice there that the top of the pops are a play group and this one move and groove. Now move and groove is moving to music, just dancing away, having fun, mums um, or primary carers and their kids at the service. Um, so it's an example of how uh, you can go from very specific um, work around helping mums enjoy and understand their new babies through to assisting joy, play, unstructured time that's just about having fun. Um, so what did mothers say that they valued? Um, this is again from the survey. Social contact and support, as we saw in the slide of why people come. Um, there's a sense of being welcome, as you see there, that People genuinely are happy to see me. Another dimension is um, the valuing of the community of other mothers, others who are going through that same kind of experience as themselves. A lot of them talked about, well, I can check out that I'm not the only one fretting about, you know, teething or nappy rash or toilet training. They could share their experiences and really valued and felt that they were learning from other mums. So, uh, which I thought was very valuable because it, it enabled mums to feel a sense of power between themselves. What we're clearly seeing in this is not a model of deficit where families feel labelled and where they feel that the, uh, all source of all power and knowledge is the professionals and they have to sit there and be fixed. What they're saying here is we get support and validation from a community in an environment that facilitates us having that community. But it's knowing they're here if needed to talk. So it's also an awareness that underneath that community and sharing with other mums just like them and learning, wow, I'm just not alone, if they did need professional support, there's somebody who's actually qualified and has the knowledge um, that they can ask about things that might be worrying them. Um, so it's quite, a, um, I think, a lovely model because it has succeeded so well in mums feeling empowered and part of each other's community rather than part of a community that has to be done to. Um, many of the uh, African mothers and Afghani mothers also said that they valued opportunities for social contact and support. And many of the respondents indicated to me that coming to Family Zone was their only enjoyable weekly outing, and without it, the terrors of isolation loomed large. Um, and just to add to, uh, they, so they enjoyed discussing their children. Um, they they clearly uh, said that uh, and um, uh, that without it, things would be pretty grim. Uh, and they'd, the friendships had become so strong that they continued uh, during the week 
uh, through phone calls and visits to, uh, to each other's houses. Um, just to add to what uh, um, Elspeth has said, parents' social networks are not just nice. They can provide assistance with childcare, emotional support and culturally relevant advice and information. And re previous research has shown, uh, for example, Coletta's research, that uh, parents' social networks do benefit children. Um, Coletta's research found that uh, social networks reduce mothers' aggressive or rejecting behaviours towards their children. That, and that it's and, uh, another piece of research has found strong social networks as being associated with a infant attachment security, particularly for families under stress. And a very interesting piece of research by Garbarino and Costelny, what they did is they paired suburbs that were pretty similar in terms of um, income, education levels, uh, and ethnicity, and they looked at which su some suburbs had strong social networks and some suburbs had very weak social networks. And the suburbs with strong social networks had much lower incidence of child abuse. So, yeah, uh, uh, parent uh, networks are good for children, it would seem. Back to Elspeth. Okay, so another, another important one um, was respite. Um, those of you who've been in the space of being a young mum at home, it can be very, very isolating and the responsibility can be continuous and overwhelming, particularly where a child has special needs or there's a few under the preschool age to be looked after and it can get pretty demanding. Um, and you, you see there that the mum uh, Rita is acknowledging that she can have a bit of a rough time um, and knows that she can give her baby into the, someone else's care. A key point here is to recognise that Rita is willing to disclose having a rough time. One of the things that that tells you is she's feeling pretty safe. Because if she was feeling under threat, it would be the last thing she'd be prepared to reveal. And that goes back to that power relationship stuff. And once again, I'm able to relax. It gives me a few minutes to myself. Um, staff keep you in the know and I chat as I'm leaving. So she comes in to just give herself a change of scenery, something to focus her mind, but is aware that there is a source of information there and she is able to tap into what's going on. So the things that she is taking away is an update on what she needs to know that's going on and a little bit of time out. Ali? Um, the African and Afghan uh, women uh, said that they really valued the opportunities to learn that they received through Family Zone. They loved learning about other people's cultures and they particularly liked the going on the excursion excursions. Some of them said to me that they don't feel safe going with their children to parks. They feel that public spaces are unsafe places. And so going on excursions with Family Zone gives them a chance to get out and about and have a look at what, what's in Adelaide. Um, and they also really appreciated opportunities to learn more about the options that were, were available to them in terms of education, health, welfare and other support services. And as well, practising their English is uh, identified as an um, opportunity at Family Zone. Um, and then we asked mums also what changed for children and I've just selected these few because I think they illustrate it very well. Again, note that first quote, I actually hated my youngest son there for a while. I resented him. Uh, how safe does that mum feel to start to talk about those feelings? And of course we know that people don't approach services because they're terrified that they'll be judged, that they, that they might lose their children, that they might be seen as bad mothers. So I, I think one of the things that we have to recognise is that enabling of an environment where people are free to talk about their feelings without fearing consequences is huge. And that next slide shows how mums 
try to manage and conceal when they're having a hard time because all of the stuff out there on becoming a new mum is all with the Vaseline on the lens and there's soft music and there's little, you know, pink and white and flowers and it all looks so lovely and gentle. <laughs> and it's often not like that when you're um, grappling with a couple of preschoolers and it's teething time and approaching meal times. So she was trying not to let her children show how, know how she was feeling. Um, and she was happy that her child could come and mix with other children. This woman had moved to South Australia and her husband was in defence and she was getting on the phone weeping to him about how lonely and horrible it was. And she said, well now, that doesn't happen anymore. I, I feel I've got a community and he can go to work without worrying that his wife's at home somewhere feeling desperate and alone and scared of what she might do. So it changed everything for everybody and she's referring there to things are better for her, things are better for her child and things are better for her partner. So a kind of a global uh, improvement. And, it, and the, the bottom one, um, how part of managing having two young'uns in the preschool section, both with high needs, um, the older one feeling that the new young bub is taking up all of mum's time and they never get any space. So this mum saw um, that family zone enabled her to have some precious time just playing with her older child and reconnecting with that relationship while being confident that her baby was okay and being looked after and she could take her mind off her for a little while and focus fully on the other child. So I, th I think, you know, th those quotes illustrate the complexity and depth of change that's available in a supported setting where mums feel that they're able to form communities and relationships and they recognise how it's helping them in their relationships with their children and with their wider relationships in the community. Um, the African and Afghan women also saw benefits to their children. They told me, I, I didn't ask them about benefits, I just asked them about what they valued. And they really said that they uh, valued the fact that their children had opportunities to get out of the house. Um, remember that they didn't feel safe taking their children to public place, spaces, um, that their children had opportunities to interact and play and to develop confident relationships with other children and adults. And they said that their children's behaviour had been much, uh, was much more challenging when they didn't go to family zone. Uh, and they also saw that their own responses to their children's behaviour was um, much more positive since coming to Family Zone. And they, uh, particularly the African women, talked about the, uh, their children's opportunities uh, to learn English. And African people often speak multiple languages and they know a lot about um, bilingual development. Uh, and uh, yes, yeah, so they, they saw uh, the, the chance for their infants to hear uh, English uh, in a meaningful way as a really important uh, underpinning for their language development. Now the African uh, group also has a sort of attached to it a facilitated play group and um, the African women uh, really um, said quite strongly to, to me that they appreciated the relationship that their children had made with the coordinator of this African children's play, of the play group that they attended with their children. And they said that this person had helped their children and they really enthused about how her smiling, friendly nature, that she seemed to really care and had passion. They said the word passion um, uh, several times, well the translator translated it several times. And, um, and that she said that this coordinator gave a lot of positive uh, communication to them about their children. And um, that they wanted this, they, they loved this coordinator so much that they wanted her to come to their home. And I think that these points say to me about the importance of strength-based and relationship-based approaches 
And uh, I think it's also saying that they, these African women wanted more integration between the home and the site. Uh, and also the, between the playgroup and the home visiting components of Family Zone. So now it's back to Carl. I'd like to ask the other communities for children's sites in South Australian managers to come up here briefly. Uh, we're going to run about a little, we're running a bit late, um, but we, we want to do this at least have 10 minutes. We might run 10 minutes late into the uh, breakout sessions this afternoon, um, but I think it's worthwhile doing that. So if you could just bear with us, and we'll give a prize to each of the managers if they're able to keep what they say down to two minutes. Because um, I think the point is that um, what's just been said about what's been happening with Salisbury, you could say ditto for um, the other five communities for children's sites in all kinds of different ways. And um, so, um, where's Fiona? She's not here. Uh, <laughs> Sue, so maybe you can start off. Sue, so you've done things differently at Ockeringa because you, you haven't established a child and family centre like a number of the other sites have. Um, what would you say about, what, what would be the strengths of what you've done at, at Ockeringa? Thanks, Carl. Um, when we talked about this quickly, we thought we'd pick a different topic. For us in Ockeringa, it's a whole of community approach. And what does that actually mean? We have, Ockeringa looks like, obviously families, children and community, and they're the most important part of our site. We've got four community centres or houses. We've got a children's centre with three others on the borders of our site. 17 primary schools, eight childcare centres, 11 kindies, um, 36 playgroups, plus NGOs and government departments, sporting and community groups. So what does that, that actually look like? And what's our role in trying to get services and community looking at a whole of community approach? For us, it's about time. So. What does time mean? It's giving ourselves permission to take the time to build relationships. It's giving our staff and our teams permission to take the time to do the same. Everything is built on relationships. It's about leaving individual agendas and leaving our hats at the door and looking at things from a different perspective. It's about thinking differently and applying that different thinking in how we work and within the capacity of our funding and our resources. Um, it's about involving kids, kids and families and parents. They're on our committee. The kids come to our committee meetings. Parents need to be involved in design, delivery, planning, implementation and evaluation of everything that we do. We have children's reference groups established. We've looked at child-friendly initiatives to incorporate the business community and how do we get sport and rec clubs playing from a whole community approach. We have fabulous services and agencies working in our region and how do we work to build on and support the fabulous work that's already happening. So from our perspective, um, a whole of community approach is really, really dependent on the strengths of relationships in the area. So take the time to build the relationships, know who does what, and if you don't know, know how to find out or where to find out that information. Thanks. Thank you, Sue, well done. Annie, you've got lots of Aboriginals living up in Port Augusta. How have you found, what have you found effective up there? We've got um, approximately 35 spoken languages, Aboriginal languages in Port Augusta at the moment. We've got a population of about 15,000 people, um, a few cold representatives, not a lot at the moment, a few Afghanis. Um, we took a different approach. When we first started, we did an extremely long consultation period before we did our community strategic plan. We consulted for nearly six months with our community. Um, we consulted on individual basis, small groups, service providers. We went into the community. We didn't expect them to come to us. We spent weeks at shopping centres, um, people's houses, um, sporting clubs, all sorts of things. Um, we used the elders to actually make sure that we were communicating correctly with the, the groups. We, um, we let them make the choices. We, um, they identified the problems in the community. They also self-identified solutions. We discussed the solutions with service providers. We went back to them, discussed the solutions again. We went to the service providers to make sure these, so these solutions that the community had thought of were possible to actually be done from the services provision end. We went back to the community. We discussed what the services had said. The community made some more decisions about what they wanted. We come up with the community. We discussed it together, come up with a final list, took it back out to the community again for a really big consultation to make sure that's what they wanted. Then we started to implement the activities. We um, encourage the, the community to actually be involved in the implementation of the activities. We've got um, parents on advisory committees on all of our projects. 
We have um, a, an overarching community parent advisory committee. They're an, a, a really huge advocacy group. They've got links with council. They, um, they actually designed the council's audit for the playgrounds. Um, they have designed um, business audits. They go around and do family-friendly business audits and it, um, the business are striving to get these audits because if they get an audit and they get a tick, they get recognition in the local media for being a family-friendly business. Um, they have um, been integral in lots of things. They're negotiating with the council at the moment about parenting facilities. But they're really quite active. So we really um, promote the fact that the community need to lead it. Um, our parents um, train with um, staff from services. If we've got training that's appropriate for families to be involved with, we train them at the same time, so they're on the same knowledge page as us. We also, um, oh, just lost my train of thought. Um, there we go. Um, we have parents actually running activities. We have parents running playgroups, parents running cooking, cooking sessions. So we really, really focus on the community taking the lead, and that's how we've done it. Okay, I guess for us if, um, in Murray Bridge, we work across Murray Bridge, Tail and Bend, Callington and Manham, so a fairly large area with very low socioeconomic. But for rural practitioners, if you've ever been the person that's been lucky enough to go off to a conference and you get a new vision, you've got some new evidence um, and you come back to your agency or your community with that passion and that drive and that knowledge that you think can make a difference, but you're one voice, what does it do? So what we decided to do was we would bring in a learning culture so that all the agencies could come together and we would buy in some of the best speakers across Australia. So we had Dorothy Scott come to Murray Bridge, we've had the Australian Childhood Foundation come, we've had many people from Women's and Children's Hospital from the universities come and teach us so that we all learnt together. We all learnt a shared language, we learnt a shared understanding, but what it did was invigorate people's practice and we brought people together. I was really pleased to hear Paul talk about food because what we did too was feed people and give them the time and the space then to talk about their knowledge and to talk about in the context of their community and their work, what would it do and how could they make a difference. We also then have bi-monthly reflection learning circles for different practitioners to come together and to be honest and open and talk about how is it going? This is what I'm struggling with. How can you help? So nothing is done in isolation. So we no longer have those people standing at the water cooler going, I'm so excited and I'm so passionate. Why is anybody coming on my page? Because we've got a whole community learning together in that place. Thank you, Helen. I think we can all give them a prize for being brevity. <laughs> the other community is Children's Side in South Australia's Northwestern Community for Children, which is in the Port Adelaide area. And I must say that when we, they started a year before us, and one of the first things we did is, when we started, is we went to Cafe Enfield, a children's centre, and we went down to Seton Central which is the centre that Northwest Communities for Children have started down at Seton Primary School. And we learned a heck of a lot. We were really inspired by that. And that was one of the things that motivated us to move in the direction that we did. Um, Margaret said this morning in her talk that there's just not a lot of evidence around that this stuff works. Well, guys, it's starting to come together. And we're starting to get some evidence. So uh, hopefully um, we can keep doing that and we can keep seeing this kind of way of working uh, happen. And this afternoon in our panel, we'll, we'll, we'll look at some more about how that can happen and what we can do to change policies and to, to get more of it happening. However, at the moment, what is happening to you is you're very hungry, so uh, you can have some, <laughs> some, some lunch. Um, and we'll probably, well, we're not too bad. We'll, we'll probably, we may start our breakout sessions about five minutes late. We've left a little bit of a buffer in there. So hopefully you get to your breakout sessions about 1.35. Okay, thank you.